We will hear about a successful story of a government that uses Kubernetes along with a fully automated CI CD pipeline used by multiple teams. Chris, please enlighten us on with your exciting journey. Welcome, Chris. Thanks. Okay, cool. This works? You all hear me okay? Thanks. All right. Um, so uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out to see my, uh, my talk today. It's the first time uh, speaking at KubeCon, so uh, bear with me as I work out some of the jitters. Uh, and just want to kind of also get a bit of a poll of the audience. Uh, who here also works for a government organization of some kind? Awesome. There's more of you than I was expecting. How about, uh, so who here is just starting out on their journey to Kubernetes, whether you're government or private? Awesome. So. This is kind of, when I came here to KubeCon, or when I came to KubeCon for the first time last year, I was kind of setting out to look for answers, figure out what path to take, and there wasn't really a presentation for me, so this is kind of structured to be that presentation, to kind of give that helping hand and hopefully give you some tools on your journey and selecting the tools and uh, dealing with um, how to you know, manage all those vendors out in the vendor hall, what to, what to pick and uh, where to put, them, put things. So without further ado, um, we'll get on with the uh, presentation. Uh, actually, one thing I want to do, do you mind if I take a quick photo just to prove that people actually showed up to this? <laughs> okay, great. I'll take that as a yes. Thank you. I get something to show off back home. So um, that being said, uh, just to give a little context for the city, um, as most of you probably know, Government of Canada, um, that's uh, their home base. Um, we're wedged over here in between Montreal and Toronto, so two much cooler cities. Uh, normally go there for fun, uh, but we're getting better. It's good. Um, as we all love discussing temperature, um, some fun facts. Um, I can uh, confirm it does get cold, very cold. But on the other hand, it gets super warm, so you can complain about the weather any time of year. It's, it's really nice. So there's the, the full spread. And uh, to give you, again, to kind of give you the scale of the city, uh, we're big. Uh, we can fit most of the major cities in, uh, in Canada within our city limits. Um, despite that, we only have a population of, uh, well, we just hit a million people. Uh, so the overall square area, you're looking at about 1,800 square miles. Uh, we did this by taking over a bunch of cities um, in about 2001. So that was 11 cities and townships that amalgamated to form this, this heart-shaped city, which is kind of great. Um, it's also delightfully representative of Canada. We have a large rural area and a small urban area that's clustered along the Quebec border, so much like we cluster along the American border. Um, so with that brings a lot of complexity. So we have to support all the federal workers that live in the area, cross-border travel, we have a lot of urban and rural concerns that we also have to address. Um, and of course, maintaining the infrastructure for all this. So we have you know, libraries, paramedics, uh, accountants, a ton, ton of different services that we need to provide to our constituents. So, you know, here, we'll just pull this up. So we have um, about 17,000 employees, about 300 of which are in IT, and about 100 of those are developers. The rest are either infrastructure or business, uh, business support. Um, we have about 120 different lines of business that we need to, uh, to support. So uh, a good example of a team um, that I'm aware of, like, we're still dealing with all that operational weight. We want to do things faster. We want to provide more value. But we don't have, the staff to application ratio is a little off. So we have one team that uh, they have about six people, but they have 30 applications to support across a number of different business lines. So a day-to-day -day, uh, in the life of one of our developers can be quite, uh, quite unique and challenging. So, so here we go. We have about 400 applications that we need to support now of plus, and it's, you know, it's off the shelf. It can be big things like um, uh, ArcGIS um, or uh, custom homegrown uh, Java applications or .NET. Uh, we also have a large amount of Perl applications, which is uh, also interesting. So where, did we, where does Kubernetes kind of fit into this? So we wanted to more or less, we're coming to the, lot, the end, end of a life of a lot of our old Unix servers, and we need to migrate those. And of course, cloud is a big part of that. 
Uh, so Kubernetes fits into our landscape as a nice you know, transition. We can move things um, on-prem uh, to containers and then eventually port over to uh, uh, Azure, which is our cloud provider of, uh, of choice. So it gives us a nice safe area to experiment, adopt, and then we can move up. So that's, that's why we chose Kubernetes. So I'm assuming most of you have decided you're already going to go to Kubernetes and we're kind of uh, working to get going. So that, how do you get going? Um, the first spot I looked, it's the CNCF landscape. Now, first time I looked at that, I was kind of scared. Um, anyone else have the same kind of like, just turn, close the web browser, go away? Um, yeah, so we had decided we wanted to go down that route. We'd done a bunch of uh, small demos, you know, spin up a Cube ADM server, but we needed it to be a little bit more formal. We knew we didn't have the staff to support, you know, rolling our own. So we had to go with something that was enterprise grade. So we look at that. We got scared, just went back to the drawing board. Um, we created a project team, uh, created with a bunch of different, uh, uh, so it was a cross-functional team, so we had security at the table, infrastructure, applications, uh, some architects, and we kind of worked on uh, breaking things down into smaller chunks. So this is what we did. Um, you don't have to necessarily follow that, it's just a way to, for, it was a way for us to kind of logically break things down into stages. Um, so out of the gates, the first, the big thing for us was finding a Kubernetes distribution. Uh, so this was about a year, year and a half ago, maybe a little bit more. Um, since then, the CNCF has put out their uh, trail, trail road. Um, so it has a very similar purpose. Um, These categories are a little different. It's focused on the CNCF tools, not necessarily greater landscape, but it's another nice tool if you want to kind of compartmentalize things and uh, build out from there. Um, so as I was saying, the last slide, our first point of order was pick a distribution. Um, at the time, a lot of, so I've been thinking about the differences between this KubeCon and past KubeCon, just in terms of themes. So last KubeCon, I think uh, every major vendor was going on, uh, they're conformant, you know, they're, there's a Kubernetes conformant test. So that was, everyone was moving that way, which is awesome. So all of these here are now Kubernetes compliant or Kubernetes conformant distributions. So you can take your Kubernetes code, roll it through, uh, which is great for not getting locked in. Uh, but a year and a half ago, it wasn't as, um, as prevalent, so we had to be a little bit more uh, selective in terms of how we did that. So we broke things down a little bit more in terms of our uh, project objectives. So we wanted vendor agnostic. Uh, we've been burned in the past by going with a specific technology or vendor. It, then the technology dies off and we're stuck holding, holding on to that. So we wanted the ability to be able to move effectively, you know, uh, have more ownership and control over our destiny instead of waiting for, you know, someone else to release a patch. So Kubernetes gave us that. So we, uh, our focus was we needed open source Kubernetes. We knew we wanted to roll on-prem as well as in the cloud. Um, reason for that, some of our workloads are a little bit more sensitive um, from a security point of view, so we'd want to keep those on-house as well as extend to the cloud for a more uh, public-facing, uh, non-sensitive uh, workloads. Uh, we also uh, wanted to focus on multiple clusters. So instead of having a large monolithic cluster, uh, having the capacity to make small little clusters to reduce the blast radius, being able to design you know, our special snowflake cluster for, say, PCI applications, things like that, where security isn't necessarily mainline. And of course, the, the, big, uh, the other big one is we need an enterprise level support because we didn't have the knowledge in house. We were working on it, uh, we still are, but. We just couldn't dedicate a full team to knowing the ins and outs of everything Kubernetes. So this would be something. Uh, this was something that would be able to help us, and of course, it would get help uh, get management on side, knowing that, you know, if you know if someone like me were to win the lottery, um, they would be able to fall back on something. Um, and that the other big one at that point in time was our based uh, our back wasn't as prevalent as it is today. So there are a couple distributions that didn't support that, so that was one of our requirements. You don't really need to worry about that one anymore, but I just want to kind of put that in there just to give you a bit of a, a time uh, or some of the challenges, challenges we were dealing with at the time. So the other thing that we did, so we kind of we figured out more or less what we wanted, so then we tried to kick the tires. You know, we downloaded Minikube, Minishift. Um, we trialed a bunch of different vendors to figure out what worked. And that was really good, because then we found out what actually worked within our, um, with our own environment, and it started opening up questions like, how can we leverage things that we already have on-prem? So if we go back, there, on. So point three, storage. Um, so at that time, 
I was looking at things like Rook, um, what else? Uh, yeah, well, let's stick with Rook for now, o uh, Open EBS and a few other things. Um, but that required a little extra work on top of that. So we're still just grasping you know, Kubernetes, so all these other things on top of that added a little bit more complexity. Um, so started asking around, well, what are we using for our internal storage provisioning? Turned out it was NetApp. Uh, NetApp has a lovely old plugin or a tool called Trident, which allows you to hook into NetApp and use that as your persistent storage provider. So that let us take advantage of technology that we, we had already invested in and already had the knowledge in-house, so we didn't have to go and rebuild the wheel. Um, uh, we're also working with this on our NetApp installation for, uh, for DNS uh, stuff. So these are a lot of tools that a lot of organizations may already have in place. So, you know, it's a really good idea to try to leverage what you already have. Um, also, trials, they're really easy to come by. Um, as most of you have already found out in vendor hall, that, you know, you just ask and you'll be able to get a key and be able to try something out, see how it fits in your environment. And this also, from a government point of view, who here has had to go through an RFQ or a request for proposal or a request for code? It's not fun, right? It takes a really long time. Um, apologize to any vendor that I've dealt with in here. We've on a couple multi-year uh, RFPs or engagements, so you know sometimes you talk to someone like, oh, well, can we have this wrapped up by the end of the month? Yeah, not going to happen. Um, so being able to try things out, it lets you. We, we found to let you or let let us write a more detailed proposal so it doesn't just go to, um, uh, so you get a better idea of what you actually want. So when things go to procurement, you get a better product because you've uh, narrowed it down to what needs you actually have. Then there's also the focusing on processes. Um, we've heard a lot of this uh, in DevOps, you know, people over process, process over tools. Um, I tend to think of this, kind of, Kubernetes, DevOps landscape, it's a giant build-it-yourself puzzle. All these pieces are swappable, um, which is really fun. So when you start focusing on patterns instead of over what a specific tool does, you can really do some fun things. Um, this, thinking, this thinking led us towards GitOps, uh, which is a lot of fun. So uh, anyone here hear of Flux or Argo or Jenkins X? Okay, a few of you. Check them out. They're really, really, really good. Uh, so we have a few teams that you're using uh, different uh, you know, uh, uh, Git sources, so GitHub, GitLab, and Azure DevOps. And we needed something kind of fit in between all of those. Um, and the GitOps model, you store your configuration in Git, and with Flux or Argo, something sits in your cluster and then just pulls down and syncs. So it's rather neutral, it's not a push action, so it doesn't need our, your access to your cluster. Uh, in, the instant, in the case of Azure DevOps, you know, you save your code up there, it doesn't necessarily, it can't, oh sorry, it can't necessarily push to your on-prem cluster. So that's where something uh, uh, like Flux or Jenkins or Argo comes in, because it's a pull-based uh, pull action, which is really, really awesome. And of course, you don't have to give people kubectl, uh, which also a bonus. Uh, try to avoid that uh, for production stuff. Um, so with all that, so this is just a glimpse of our tool set so far. Um, these are some of my favorite, uh, favorite tools um, that I have in place. Uh, Flux Open Policy Agent. Um, if you haven't caught any of the OPA um, sessions so far this week, um, I think there's a bunch more. Uh, do check them out. If, uh, you know, uh, for, from a security point of view, anytime we bring up OPA, being able to write policy as code. Um, for those of you who don't know, Open Policy Agent is a uh, generic policy engine, so you can write, you know, a um, big example would be you can only pull in a container that comes from a trusted registry. So it gives you a lot of control over that and, you know, really helps get your security team on board and it opens up a lot, of, a lot of potential for locking down and controlling what goes into your, uh, your cluster. Um, of course, Flux is really good. It works great with Open Policy Agent. Linkerd is an awesome uh, uh, service mesh. Um, Istio is another good one um, that you've probably also heard of. Uh, so all that said, this is the easy part. Assembling your, your own puzzle, great. Hard part is, how do you actually get people to use it? So, what we did, we took the build it, build it first and let them come approach. Um, we found that's, you know, kind of dangle the carrot, people will eventually come. Uh, instead of doing that uh, forced adoption, um, we find that normally gets people's back up. Um, using a, you know, working closely with a few teams, letting them have some success, kind of working out and using, uh, kind of setting up like champions, you know, things, uh, people like that who can advocate on your behalf as you're growing things out. And, 
Uh, like this is a slow process. I know we all want to get going fast, like, oh, this is really cool technology, we can do a lot with it, but you know, uh, take it slow. Try not to bite off more than you can chew. Um, so we've taken the approach, you know, we've done, done a lot of bunch of presentations, some presentations to senior management just to get the word out, make, get people comfortable with the concept of moving from servers to containers to Kubernetes to DevOps and all, all that fun stuff, um, do one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, we've also found Fipian friends. Everyone loves them. If you can get the books from Microsoft, do so. It uh, breaks things down into a nice little bite size, or the Kubernetes concept into a nice bite size uh, format. Um, we've also, uh, people are, uh, just before I left, I uh, had an email from my manager um, asking me to set up a kind of calendar invite to watch uh, the Kubernetes office hours. Um, it's something, just a little self-promotion. Um, I'm a panelist on that, and we do a live stream every Wednesday, third Wednesday of the month, where we take questions from uh, the broader internet and try to help uh, help these, uh, or sorry, help people use Kubernetes. So, um, back to kind of helping people. So we try to work, as uh, my team is focused on supporting that core platform. So we work with other teams, try to find their pain points, find ways we can address those within Kubernetes, using containers, using DevOps, using a lot of automation to make those things go away. And a few points that we've been finding people get excited about, at least from the dev side, is scalability, as well as the self-healing. Um, I'm sure we all like getting woken up at four o'clock in the morning to reboot a Tomcat app. Um, this hopefully uh, solves that, and then from a policy point of view, uh, Open Policy Agent gets a lot of people excited. I've never seen so many like managers leave a meeting about Kubernetes with smiles on their face after seeing what Open, open Policy Agent can do. And uh, of course, automating all the things. So we try, it, well, as when you're asking people to learn Kubernetes and containers, it's a bit of a cognitive load you're dropping on them. It's like, okay, well, first you have to learn containers, then you have to learn Kubernetes, then you have to learn distributed computing, and then you have to learn trace. It just kind of eyes will glaze over eventually. So to help people adopt that, we've tried to hide a lot of the, the, the scary stuff but behind layers of automation. So the onboarding process is pretty quick, but as people want to peel back the layers of the onion, they can. So everything is kept in, uh, kept in Git. It's open so people can see, see what we're doing. Um, so we're using starter templates um, that have some of our security um, policies already baked in. We're looking to migrate that to Helm. Now that Helm 3 is out and Tiller is gone. Um, yeah, so this, this helps. And of course, Flux is also uh, a key part of that. Um, so one of the nice features of Flux is it will also monitor your um, container re re registry. And if it sees a new image, it pulls it down and deploys it into that um, the deployment, and then it'll write the change back to Git. So you have this kind of full automated cycle, which is really awesome. Um, so we've been using this process to migrate all of our legacy Perl and Java apps. Uh, thankfully, they're mostly, you know, they're pretty simple uh, web, uh, websites, they're not microservices, so the pattern that we use to build and deploy is pretty, uh, pretty similar and there's not a lot of modifications. So uh, to get people onboarded, it's a good path to kind of, uh, well, this is easy, and kind of go from there, build some confidence, and then they're, you know, before long they're starting to build their own things, they're asking questions about, well, what else can I do, which is awesome, I love those questions. And so just to give you an example of one of the process, installation processes we have, so this is our uh, one, a project GitHub GitLab repo. So we have a GitLab, a CI YAML in there, and a Docker file and a WAR file. So uh, some teams are still uh, migrating from TFS to Git. So that's another thing that we have to uh, we're working on teaching everybody. So in this case, uh, the dev can still work with TFS. They get the WAR file out. They drag and drop that WAR file into GitLab. It kicks off the build process, deploys the container updates the YAML file for the deployment in the second repo. So with just that click and drag, they've deployed to Kubernetes and they get an automated build process, which is awesome. And then also out of that, you know, we get metrics from Prometheus. You get, uh, we're using Linkerd, so we get traffic, uh, traffic metrics, and then we also get per route metrics. So they get this out of the box. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to re-instrument those 15-year-old applications. It's just there. Um, this is really exciting for people. It's like, okay, well, now what can I do? How do I take advantage of this? So we try to follow that up, a lot of training, try to get people interested. So we have an access to Pluralsight. Uh, anyone else have organizations with Pluralsight? Awesome. Uh, the Nigel Poulton Kubernetes courses are fantastic if you haven't seen them already. Um, 
We also recently we signed up for uh, Kubernetes Fundamentals. So we're sending, a, uh, I think, about six people on that um, to get them uh, skilled up. And also, uh, based on, um, so I, I'm a certified Kubernetes admin. So based on my experience, um, I recommend if anyone wants to go further, the tasks on Kubernetes.io. And if you want to really peel back the layers of the onion, uh, Kuber, Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the hard way is uh, second to none in that, uh, those regards. We'll kind of wrap it up. Uh, I know it's been pretty high level, um, so there's a lot to a lot to cover. So I'm hoping there will be a little room, uh, a lot of room for uh, questions after this. Uh, so just to give you an idea of where we're at, we have I think about 10, 10 clusters we're managing right now. Uh, we have internal dev, QA, prod, external QA, prod. Um, we have three teams who are actively engaged and developing their own applications without any. Um, input from uh, the core platform team, which I think is great and lets us focus on other people. And you know, the whole point of our team is to teach people how to fish uh, instead of doing that for them. And it's working great so far. Uh, we just had our first public application being served up to the public. Um, that went live on the first. Uh, we did it on a Friday, and no, no servers died, or pods for that matter, which was awesome. And you know, we still have some teams who are, act who are we're a little ahead of the curve in terms of adopting the cloud, so we have some people using app services as well as uh, people are still wanting to use VMs. So we still have a little bit of uh, evangelizing and sales, uh, sales pitching to do, but you know, uh, long story short, not everything belongs in Kubernetes, and using app service for a cloud migration is a valid choice, and it can be proved to be quite useful. So to look ahead uh, for where we're going, uh, we should have a bunch more Java applications served up to the public, so we'll be taking down um, the Java Tomcat apps that are being served on uh, old Unix servers, putting them into containers. Um, all of our Perl web forms are going to be hosted internally. Um, we're also coming up to the final stages of writing our corporate uh, security standards. So that was one of the fun things about engaging security really early on. Uh, we started this process of uh, writing the standards. Uh, so. Uh, Sometimes security is viewed as kind of like that that roadblock. You build your application, they come swooping in at the end, like, no, it's not secure enough. So we've been engaged with them to bake a lot of that in so there aren't those surprises. And it's been very fruitful, and they've been a very strong uh, supporter of what we've been doing. And it's been a very, it's been a very beneficial relationship. Um, in terms of the cloud adoption, we've been working on you know, uh, just sorting out the governance. Uh, when you move into Azure, you know, setting up your service accounts or uh, service principles, how do you dole them out, how do you do automation around them. It's something that is uh, kind of a broader organizational question that we're, uh, we're working through right now. And we're also working on increasing the automation tooling uh, behind our platform. So one of our mission, uh, sorry, one of our big business plans for next year is to automate everything in our Kubernetes stack from the servers through to firewalls and um, networking. So it's a big project, but we're hoping to uh, to have that done sometime in the next calendar year. So right now it's uh, lightly automated, but we want to go full automation, which would be uh, awesome. So uh, some key takeaways. Um, we found setting objectives was really helpful, working through that pathway that you develop based on what your requirements are. Uh, either develop or just focus on deployment patterns. Um, so patiently spread awareness. You know, use, find those carrots that you can dangle to get people to uh, come over. And automate as much as you can. <laughs> It is awesome just to be able to not have downtime or copy and pasting files over from one server to the other for uh, different production regions. And of course, uh, keep coming back to KubeCon. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I learn a lot every time I come here, and I hope uh, everyone here has. And to kind of help out, I, put, I made a GitHub repo with a bunch of Kubernetes resources, um, some deployment files, uh, some, uh, so some GitOps style flux stuff, as well as a list of educational resources and other tooling. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me at uh, chris.carty at ottawa.ca. And if you prefer Twitter, I'm Macintosh Prime there. Uh, you can also find me at uh, hanging out the, the Kubernetes Slack. And with that, Questions? Yes. Oh, sorry, Mike's over here. We'll go over there next. <laughs> okay, yeah. thanks. So, good talk. So, um, um, I have a question. So, since the migration takes time and also engineering time, yeah. so, um, how do you handle this kind of trade off of resource contention between developing new features as a, for the developer and also the, like the migration? Uh, the, 
the, the yeah, as, I'm sorry, because the, 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 we're trying to put the, like, developing new features that's with the different teams. So we're trying to provide them the tools to kind of be able to offload a lot of the operational work that they do. Right, but as uh, your customer, yeah. right, it may have the pressure to develop new features. Yes. And migration may not be the top priority. How do you convince them? That's part of, that's been taking some time. Uh, we have a couple teams who are very, so the team that I mentioned earlier, where they have like 30 apps, they're very operationally driven. So we have a member of our team who is a little bit more programming oriented. So he's been working more or less embedded with them to build out or migrate their tool to containers to give them a help, that helping hand. So when they're ready, the switch is a little easier. I see. How long does this migration happen? Uh, how long, I mean, from the time you scope this project to the time like you finish the migration? Um, it depends on the complexity of the app. Like uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the platform, that we've, it's been about a year and a half getting all the core components together. But uh, say for some of our Java or Perl apps, it can take a few days, uh, maybe a week. But scaling up the developer takes a little bit longer. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, Tyler Probasco, uh, U.S. Air Force. Hey, cool. Um, we're, uh, you know, obviously on our way to try and do yeah. replicate some of the things. I, I read the uh, the brief from uh, the D D D and D. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, it, as I'm sure you found in in your experience, and as you touched on a little bit here, one of the hardest things to change in all of this is actually the culture. Governments yeah. are notoriously. Um, change averse. Yes. I was just wondering if you could go a little bit deeper into like any specific examples you have or things that you you and your team did to help um, for lack of a better term the frozen middle um, and you know the bureaucracy kind of overcome their fear to, to making yeah. these changes and transition to, to doing yeah. this. Yeah so we've been working more for my grassroots approach so the core team that I've been working with has been made up of infrastructure and uh, some networking and security. So working with them, showing what's possible, and having their input, and that's the big one. Like, yeah, people are risk averse, but it's I find that really comes out if they're being told to do something instead of having a hand in. Okay, well, we have these issues that we need to solve. These are the tools that we can do it. Get a lot more buy-in when they're um, when you're nice about it. You know, <laughs> follow the code of conduct kind of kind of right. thing. So okay. that's how we've been approaching. Like, it hasn't. We haven't got to every department yet, but we've been. Um, in terms of like helping middle management and everything figure, because like mm. we, we found that developers, they love the idea, they want to do it. Yeah. And we've even found that like the highest levels of, of the, um, the organization, they also love the idea and they want to do it because they, but it's, it's just the, the middle management are really, because mm. they've got a job to get done as well and they're trying to divide their time up. Yeah. And that's kind of where it's hard to, yeah. to help them get going. So I think we kind of got lucky there, being that all of our servers are kind of end of life. We had to migrate somewhere, and we kind of caught that. And the, our former CTO had the directive of moving a lot of stuff to the cloud. So that was already part of the project roadmap for a lot of, um, a lot of management. So we've, we've been able to ride that wave, more or less. Um, so rather advantageous. Um, not everyone's that yeah. lucky, <laughs> but yeah, um, FIPI is also a great way to kind of break down some of those concepts. Um, uh, you find that uh, that helps, you know, just spread a little bit more of the language. So when you start talking about pods, you they people know what you're talking about. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that uh, not all applications. Uh, was suited to go to Kubernetes. Uh, yep. Which kind of applications are not suited, in your opinion? Um, probably the big one we have right now, there's some rather large monolithic applications that are running on Windows servers. You may not be able to just drag and drop those. Um, though, like, applications that are more configuration driven, where you can just kind of load, load things into a config map, or you just get, have a WAR file, and then things are designed to um, already be configuration friendly. Uh, those work, but if it's one of those, you know, applications that just everything is baked in, you bring it up, uh, more stateful uh, in uh, in that nature, you're going to have some issues. You just have to treat it more uh, more delicately. Um, but we've been avoiding those apps just because of those issues where you know we can't have multiple replicas without doing a lot of extra work. Um, like you could put it in a stateful set or something like that, but it may not be worth the 
uh, operational weight to try to fit it into that regard uh, that system. It might just be easier just to take it as it is and just drop it into a app service versus a Windows environment. So. Hi, uh, Greg Talk, Chris. I'm Hi. a fellow Ottoan. I live in the Bywood Market. Hey. Um, <laughs> Uh, awesome. So, um, how, one thing you didn't talk about was economics, so how is this going to affect my property taxes? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, most of it is open source, so we're not paying any major, major fees for, uh, for a lot of it. Um, the team is pretty small, so we're not like, hiring tons of extra people to support it. Um, and we're hoping that by consolidating a lot around uh, certain platforms like Kubernetes, we don't have, so uh, those 400 applications, a lot of that is technical debt from the, uh, those mergers with the other townships. So we have old applications that have two or three people supporting that full time just because we need it up and running. But if we migrate that to a new platform like Kubernetes, we can lower that operational cost and hopefully help in that regards. Do you, do you project um, like how many resources you're going to use? Do you have any, or do you just go blind and think, well, this is what I we need? I don't so. have any hard numbers for that. It's still early in the process. Um, I'm hoping we'll have more figures once the adoption kind of uh, picks up a little bit more. Hey, thank you for the wonderful talk. Oh, pleasure. Uh, I noticed um, for your service mesh you're using Linkerd. Yeah. And I just wanted to know the reasoning behind that um, as yeah. an alternative to Istio, why you chose Linkerd. Um, well, I'm the, the, the big reason was uh, just in terms of uh, supportability. We're a small team. Uh, currently, I'm right now the, the only full-time staff that's supporting this. So adding Istio on top of that, while really awesome, adds that extra layer of operational complexity, which we couldn't quite afford. Uh, Linkerd gave us the tools that we needed, namely uh, server smash, uh, sorry, the mutual TLS and some metric insights. So it gets us on our way to moving towards the zero trust model, and it gives, it makes our security, uh, or gives us a better security stance without having to re, you know, retool things or have a team dedicated to supporting that. Um, same reason we didn't go with um, Spinnaker. Like, really awesome, but you need a lot of people to uh, know, uh, know how it works. Thank you. Welcome. I think we still have time for oh, one more. Right behind you. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. One of the questions I have is, in terms of use cases, you're probably supporting multiple applications in Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. So what's been the most security sensitive use case that you have handled? And does security uh, posture change based on how the use case is? Um, it definitely does. So the big example, we're not allowed um, keeping public information in our DMZ. So the application we just launched, it has a, a file upload component. So we were going to do everything in cluster out in the DMZ, but being that there's a security restriction where we could store the data, we had to set up an instance on the internal network and have a connection that way where the data is stored internally, but the application is external. So that was one instance. Um, otherwise, uh, we haven't touched any of our PCI applications yet, but that will, when we get there, that will provide a few more security jumps that we'll need to uh, work on. But I, I foresee us using our own separate cluster for that, just specific built with its uh, own increased um, uh, security standards. We got another one. All right, last question. All right. <laughs> Hi. Uh, what kind of scale are we talking about? How? What did, was, was your on-premise uh, architecture looking like? And did you go completely to the cloud, or do you still have like a on-premise thing, or is it a hybrid? Or it's what? going to be hybrid. Um, we have some applications that deal more uh, that deal with a lot of scale, but mostly seasonal. Those would probably remain on-prem right now while we migrate and get a feel for things, but. Uh, like I said earlier, like we're going, based on security concerns, we're going to have stuff on-prem as well as in the cloud. So for the for the future, it will be a hybrid model. Okay, thanks. 
Cool. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, just in the end, remember to put in your feedbacks in the scat.com. Yeah. And thanks, Thank everyone, you. for coming. We really appreciate it. <laughs>